May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I'm going to demystify something about our Sunday morning services here uh, for a moment. Um, you know the scripture readings that you find in the insert in your bulletin, the ones that, you know, seem to uh, sort of magically come together in a coherent story across the Sundays if you're here each Sunday? Um, they don't arrive there by accident or by some, you know, random person selecting them. They come from something called the lectionary. Does anyone know that word? A few people might know that word. Uh, you'll never really need to know that word unless you're on, like, a game show that happens to have a, you know, religious trivia question. But the lectionary is a very, very old collection of texts where uh, readings are assigned not just every Sunday, but every day of the week in a three-year rotation. And if you, uh, you know, follow the lectionary, um, both Sundays and weekdays, uh, you'll eventually get through the entirety of the, the Bible, entirety of the scriptures, uh, in a three-year cycle. Um, when it comes to what's read here on Sunday morning, though, there is sometimes uh, some variance where you're allowed to select some or all of the assigned text for the morning. And here's where the punchline comes. Uh, there's an extended piece of this morning's gospel lesson that was in the lectionary, which didn't get read this morning. And uh, I'm only telling you this because most of my sermon involves the first half of the reading. So I'm going to have to bring you up to speed on uh, what happened in the gospel just before um, we get to uh, what was read out loud for you this morning. So prior to this uh, appearance of Jesus uh, post-resurrection, we have the story of the road to Emmaus. Does anyone recognize that? The road to Emmaus, show of hands. And some of you know the story, but I'll give you a refresher. So it's after the resurrection has occurred and the women have gone to the tomb and found it empty and encountered the angels who announced that Christ has been risen. They return to the rest of the disciples and tell them the news and uh, some of the disciples go and confirm that yes, indeed, the tomb is empty. So uh, the disciples know at least one thing, that the tomb is empty and that some of the disciples claim Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Well, so a few of these disciples, two of them to be precise, go on a journey to Emmaus, which uh, I believe is about seven miles uh, from Jerusalem. Seven miles might not sound like a long journey, but when you're traveling on foot and you have to carry many of your belongings or, or you have a mule or some sort of beast of burden carrying your belongings, it's a slow going, tiresome, process to travel even just seven miles. We take this for granted, you know, we hop in our car, we're uh, seven miles away in ten minutes or less, right? This was an entire day's journey for most people uh, in Jesus' day. So these two disciples are traveling to Emmaus. We don't know what their business is there, but it must be important if they're going to, to make this journey. It's not sort of like a, hey honey, I'm going to go stroll down to Emmaus for the afternoon you know, hope you got the kids covered. But this was, uh, you planned for this. You set aside provisions and make sure you had enough water and then you planned your route. And, uh, you know, you told everybody because if you didn't come back, you have search parties would come out looking for you. Uh, you know, you might step on a snake and, uh, and wind up, you know, dying alone in the wilderness. It's just, traveling was much more frightening uh, back in Jesus' day than it is today. So the two disciples are on the road to Emmaus when they're joined by a stranger. And this stranger, they, they can't, something's familiar about him, but they, they can't really recognize who he is. Spoiler alert, it's Jesus. Uh, some sort of a, a resurrection glory is sort of veiling his identity from people on first encounter. And so they're traveling along, and this uh, mysterious stranger notices that these two travelers are pretty sad. They're pretty downcast, pretty defeated. And uh, the stranger asks them, why the long face? And uh, these two people are very surprised. Like, haven't you heard? Have you been living under a rock? Are you just passing through? Uh, this is the biggest news in all the towns around here. Jesus of Nazareth, the great prophet, someone well beloved by the people, was crucified. 
And what's more, there are rumors that his body has been taken from the tomb, and we don't know what has become of him. Like any rational people, when they hear the reports that the tomb is empty, they assume somebody has taken him. You know, they don't immediately assume, oh, that must mean a man rose from the dead, because, well, that just doesn't happen every day. So they're explaining to this stranger the current events and why they're sad, and this stranger begins to explain to them that the scriptures, the law of Moses, and the prophets, and the Psalms, and all the writings actually foretold this. And as he is unpacking the scriptures to them, the disciples said, their hearts burned within them as this man unlocked for them the scriptures. And so it, it begins to get dark, and so they get off the road, and they find a shelter somewhere, and they're ready to make camp for the night, and uh, they urge this man who wanted to keep on walking to stay with them. Stay with us for the night, because it's not safe to travel alone. And so he sits down, and they go to have dinner, and it says, the man took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And there's a cool play on words here, because it says their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and then he vanished from their sight. Just vanished into thin air. So they realized they had just had a miraculous encounter with the risen Christ, who had explained to them that this Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah, which was something that, you know, once, once the man is crucified, his claims to being Messiah are pretty much null and void for most of his followers. Messiahs don't get crucified. Messiahs win. They conquer. And so when this mysterious stranger unpacks the scriptures and says, no, this is exactly what God had always planned, and you just didn't see it, now they understand, well, Jesus really was the Messiah. And then he breaks the bread, and all of a sudden it's like, well, you're Jesus. He is risen, you know? So they had this numinous, incredible, powerful spiritual experience, and what do they do? They pack up camp in the middle of the night and walk right back to Jerusalem to share this good news with the disciples. And that's really what I find most remarkable about this story, because after all, they had just traveled all day. Tired, worn out, low on provisions, and then they camp for the night. And they decide not to wait till morning when they're rested, not to complete their journey to Emmaus with whatever business they had there, and then return, no, in the, that moment they packed up their stuff and returned to Jerusalem. Whatever business they had in Emmaus, however important it was, that can wait. That, that's uh, small potatoes compared to this experience they just had. And they need to tell. They need to tell the story. They need to share this good news, uh, first with their friends, and then with, as Jesus said, from Jerusalem to all the cities of the world. So they get back to the disciples, and they're ready to tell them this good news, but no sooner do they show up than Jesus just appears in their midst and says, peace be with you. And everyone marvels, and they think he's a ghost, right? Uh, this is probably initially what the disciples wondered over. Is this, were we seeing a real person here? Or is this a vision from the other side? And, uh, and certainly over the course of the years after that, disciples um, in all ages have argued whether Jesus' resurrection was a physical one or just a spiritual one. And the orthodox position has always been it was a bodily resurrection. And Jesus demonstrates that here, first by showing you know, his pierced hands and feet, the way he does uh, you know, in the, the account of Doubting Thomas, right, which we had uh, last week, I think. Yeah. And, um, but here he goes a step further because he can see they're still not convinced that they're not seeing a ghost. So he asks them for something to eat. And this is sort of part of uh, ancient Near Eastern uh, understandings of spirits and things, which might be a little foreign to us in the 21st century you know, West. Um, but ghosts can't eat. This was a, a surefire way to prove that somebody was a ghost or not, is uh, if they can eat. And so Jesus takes the fish, eats it in their presence, proving, putting to rest any doubt that he was, in fact, back in the flesh 
and blood, the same body that went into the grave, came out of the grave, but now full of God's eternal, abundant life, the resurrection life. And of course, then he says, you know, in your midst, these things are fulfilled. These things from the scriptures are fulfilled. And now it's your job to go out into all the world, starting in Jerusalem and then every city to the ends of the earth, and tell this good news. And that's the chapter of the story we're in. We're in that good news spreading chapter, assisted by God's Holy Spirit, telling everyone that Christ is risen, God's kingdom has come, the forgiveness of sins and reconciliation with God is freely available to all who hear this news and believe it. And this is our Emmaus journey, right? All of our lives are like, like a journey. We don't always know where we're going, but we, we like to think we're going somewhere. And sometimes we have a destination in mind, we have an Emmaus in mind, and we prepare for it, we plan for it, we get halfway there or more when we have an encounter with the Lord and realize we have to make an about face, we have to change course. That's what an encounter with the Lord can do for you. It can give you peace and comfort and healing, but it can, it can also radically disturb your whole plan, right? When you come to church, I hope you experience what the disciples on the road to Emmaus experienced. I hope you hear the scriptures and your hearts burn within you as your understanding of them is enhanced. I hope that when the bread is broken, your eyes are opened and you see Jesus. I hope you experience these things. But it's a little risky because you might realize in seeing Christ in the breaking of the bread, in having your hearts warmed and the uh, understanding of the scriptures unlocked unto you, you might realize that Emmaus is the wrong destination, and you might make it about face. The journey of the Christian life, whatever road it takes you down, the bread is here for your journey. It is here to nourish you with Christ's own body and blood. And the word is there to guide you. These things are sure in certain places that we can go to find God. That's why you come here, after all. You come here to hear his word and to receive his body and blood in the bread and the wine. You know this is the place to take rest on your journey. But you also know it's the place that might redirect your journey. So may your hearts burn, and may your eyes be open this day, and may you plot your course accordingly, but uh, plan for the unexpected. Amen. Amen.